All right, Jimmy, I think we're going to spend a little bit of time on on this episode of Palmer's Picks. Rick Veach. Jim, I'm a, I'm a big QB aficionado of these early couple of years. Some of my favorite creators are Rick Veach, Steve Bissett, John Totalbin, Tim Truman. I was ravenous for any interviews that I could find with these guys talking, any comics that I could find that any of these dudes put together because I had self-awareness enough to know that I wasn't getting published anytime soon. So the goal in my young teenage days, I was, you know, maybe 12 years old. I was 11, actually. Just get good enough to get to go to the Kubert school. And I just loved the stories. One of the stories that would come up often whenever, like, Bassett was being interviewed. And in fact, I just saw Tim Truman at a show uh, summertime last year. Rick Veach was a hero to these guys. They all knew his work on the strength of this baby right here. Two-Fisted Zombies came out from Last Gasp. 1973. This is like five years before the Kubert School is a thing. Maybe a little bit more. Rick drew this uh, with his brother who wrote it. I kind of think this is a self-portrait uh, uh, from the time. Rick Veach was good for that stuff. It mixes a little bit of uh, Greg Irons with Spain Rodriguez, with Jack Kirby. And when I heard about how he was received at the Kubert School, when Steve Bissett shows up, and sees the list of classmates, and sees Rick Veach's name on there, and gets gobsmacked from that, I had to I had to find this comic, man. And rest in peace to St. Mark's Comics. You and I went to a show, Mocha, 2004. We stayed at the St. Mark's Hotel and <laughs> wa walked right across the street, dug through their back issue bin, and this, this baby was there waiting for me, man. It's a tour de force. I love flipping through this. I don't own this book yet. I probably will by the time this is uh, this airs. But I mean, I love black and white comics and they rarely deliver. And this thing is absolutely beautiful and spectacular and everything that I like about them. You know, he's playing with textures. He's playing with value. His lettering is spot on. You mentioned Spain Rodriguez. It really calls to mind his work on Trash Man. Yes, but this is fantastic. Absolutely. You know, this is what I want in comics. It's, and, great, it's, uh, it's great what you say about the lettering, too, because let me know if your situation kind of mirrors what I'm about to describe, because it's exhibited in this comic. In the early stages of your development, when you're starting to figure things out, there are tremendous growth spurts, page after page for a while. It starts to plateau and even out, and then there's a slow growth that happens when you start to stabilize. But in the earliest parts of your interest or development as a cartoonist, there's a lot of growth. So, like, take a look at the lettering on, like, page one. And then I'm just going to skip ahead a little bit. It's all becoming more unified. And it's all tighter in the span of ten pages. You know, you see what I'm saying? And then not even talking about the actual drawing, which gets even better over time. But in this one document we are establishing an evolution of one of my top 10 favorite cartoonists. One thing that always happens to me is whenever I'm working on a project, you hit your stride. It's almost like you develop those, those muscles, whatever they are. And you can see it on display here, as you say, you know, the lettering's tighter, the drawing's spectacular by the second half of this book. Very much Spain Rodriguez right Absolutely. there. Absolutely. Uh, one visual gag that I have to call attention to because it's just one of my favorite things ever because I had to do one of those uh, double takes, <laughs> is this uh, this little zombie creature right there. Looks like he's doing a little, I guess what they call auto fellatio. <laughs> and, but it's really, he's just sucking the marrow out of a bone. And you can see, because he's fully clothed, man. So get your mind out of the fucking gutter, K Fabers. God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> but from here, Rick goes to the Kubert School. When he's there at the Kubert School, he did a lot of uh, small work for Joe on the war books, you could find like little one, two pagers, man. But they did so much licensed material. The superhero catalogs uh, has Joe's name on it. Yeah, this was for a store out of New Jersey, I believe, that did a lot of mail order business, obviously. And Kubert School was where a lot of this work was produced. And, you know, the artists are credited in the front. I don't know exactly who does which pages or anything, but I mean, like, I assume this was paid work for these guys. Absolutely. And they still uh, kept this practice going even when I was up there. The shit that you would get to do as a student would be rolling the lines for these kind of bullshits <laughs> here. Like, yeah, you're drawing the tank treads, motherfucker. You ain't drawing the dude holding the gun, man. That comes later, son. These are so fun, though. Like, the comic book ads are always a thing I love. 
And often they were done, you know, if you're looking at a Marvel comic or something, would be done with bullpen artists, you know, guys that were turning this stuff around fast. And so that's what, you know, and you would see some of these ads in, in regular comics. Exactly. So it's really awesome to see this stuff. You know, now this is nostalgic, pulling those nostalgic heartstrings for me. So they would do these kinds of ads. Um, another thing that I just recently discovered that these guys did, Tim Truman, Bissett, and Veach, that they did while they were at the Kubert School, and there'll be some imagery popping up on the screen right now, um, but they designed the action figures for the Dungeons & Dragons toy line that is, like, highly coveted, man. The War Duke figure. Classic image, man, designed by Tim Truman. The little orange troll guy. That's a Rick Veach guy. I'm saying this because I can't wait to go Google these images and pull out the sketches and the toys to show you a side-by-side -side comparison. Immediate evidence. I've been a QB aficionado since I was two years old. I don't ever remember buying those toys. They were always in my life. You know what I'm saying? So they went all over the place, did a lot of work in their early days before they really found footing in more like a more kind of stable career. This is collected material, Bedlam, two issue micro series put out by Eclipse Comics, uh, early Rick Veach, early Steve Bissett, and there are shades of the other QBs who are a part of this. Like, these guys are comics fans, and they knew the the Flegel Gang or the Flying Dutchman. I forget who's who. One group <laughs> is the Flegel Gang, the other's the Flying Dutchman, but I'm talking about the Al Williamson, Frank Frazetta, Roy Crinkle, Angelo Torres, like that crew. The idea of, like, let's get together, let's back these fucking comics out, you draw the backgrounds, I'll draw this, um... Steve, you draw the girls. Rick, you draw the monsters. Um, and then you get things done. So there are shades of all the cartoons who are in this stuff. What it collects is a lot of material that would have shown up in places like, I believe, Eclipse Comics. What I meant was Epic Comics. This would have probably been in, like, Epic Comics or, or uh, Heavy Metal. Some of these, these things appeared. There were a lot of venues for small comic strips at this time, 1978. Man, that's a good page. And you could see John Totalbin is named in here, directed by the Spider. We know who that is, man. That's Bissett. Yeah, all the movie poster stuff, it's such a Bissett, clearly in his wheelhouse. One of the things that, that I've always adored about Rick Veach's work is his use of like multimedia. Airbrush, there are stories of him melting crayons on the page to achieve certain weird effects. Frankly, it was a bleeding edge practice in these early days. You didn't know what the heck your stuff was going to look like until you saw the printed page. So this actually doesn't work great. Like, like it's, it's pretty muddy, but he would see this, and then he would be able to adjust accordingly moving forward. It's so ambitious visually. Look you know, at nothing that. was doing... Uh, practically no one was working this way at the time. Because as you say, Ed, reproduction, very challenging. Challenging enough just to be a comic book artist, and he's showing up writing, coloring drawing, sometimes lettering. It's a, it's a pretty unusual set of skills that he brings to comics from the beginning, from before he even gets to the Kubert School, but when he shows up at Epic and Marvel, he's already doing all this stuff. So this is like Rick Veach a la Bob Sekurak type. Uh, this is clearly like a dope piece of post-Air Pirates Funnies underground comics. Ogden Look, Whitney's Herbie. Rick Veach is not playing, man. He's not... He's not pretending with his comics loves, man. And this is just a great panel-to-panel -panel storytelling right there, man. But let's just call attention to this amazing spread. Veach, Bissett, Total Ben collaboration right there, man. I can't find it in either of these uh, two issues. Perhaps a kayfaber out there will be able to, to uh, link something in the comments. But there's some old reprint that, um, that reprinted a bunch of their work from uh, Scholastic. Thinking about it, I think it's called First Folio published by Pacific Comics, maybe. But there are strips in there written by uh, Bob and whatever his wife's name, Stein. And it turns out that it's early writings from R.L. Stein, who will go on to uh, write the Goosebumps books. These are really great, and you can find them cheap. From there, he's still doing a bunch of small stuff with, with Epic Comics, and Shiny Beasts is a good reprint of a lot of the uh, the stuff he was trying out with with, with Epic Illustrated. One of my takeaways going through his work again for this for this Palmer's Picks is how everything's interesting looking. We see a lot of different cartoonists as we do the show and as we reference different things. 
and it's incredible visually how how hard he's pushing. You just don't ever see this level. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm stumped trying to think of another cartoonist. He's pushing layouts. He's pushing media. It looks great in color. It looks great in black and white. It's so ambitious. One of the uh, one of the courses at the Kubert School is called Methods and Materials, man, and they they tax you on uh, learning all that stuff, airbrushing and all sorts of things, man. But this is all you notice. It's all small work. It's all like one two page things. Perhaps it might be good to show that page of Bedlam to just like illustrate what we were describing about how you didn't know what the heck your thing was going to look like until you saw it on the final printed page. So here's the dif difference between printing something on like glossy stock and or. Uh, toothy i guess this would be baxter paper which is something that they touted hi very highly in those mid 80s added some additional color and stuff 78 this very likely could have been a cubert school assignment yeah it's so crisp this reproduction in the black and white it's almost scratch board i think it is like that totally looks like scratch board or maybe just like a reductive like lay some ink down scratch it up but the most congruent piece of work that uh mr veach did with uh Epic Illustrator is probably like the serialized Abraxas and the Earthman. Listen, don't don't diss my man for using a papyrus font. <laughs> I'll, I'll, bust, I'll bust your ass if you talk shit on this dude in front of me. I do think he's underrated, or at least under-talked about. This stuff looks incredible. You know, you could put this next to almost anything you'd pull out of Heavy Metal Magazine for, you know, comparison purposes. Any of the coloring that was done at indie comics in the 80s, you know, where guys are using different techniques for reproduction, like... Veach is there. Like, he's doing all of this. He's one of my faves. Ended up doing the Heartburst graphic novel, one of the first, uh, number 10 to be exact, Marvel graphic novels, man. At this point, he's, solidif he's solidified as a cartoonist. He makes comics. He makes And he makes Rick Veach comics. You're not going to get this guy on a Jobber X-Men book. He has his own ideas, and he has a lot of vision. That's one thing that I will say about this man. His comics exhibit a ton of vision. He has... A lot going on in that brain. One of my favorite qualities of young cartoonists is that like bursting with ideas thing. So this is, you know, mid 80s. We, we've seen stuff from uh, 72, 73, Two-Fisted Zombies. He's no longer a young cartoonist, but it's still that bursting with ideas. Like every page is filled. It's visually inventive. It's lots of characters and concepts. And it's a mature cartoonist at this point. And it's still just like energy coming out. Let's not tease where we're headed, man. Let's get into some King Hell Heroica type shit, man. So this is the one uh, picking up. This is still a Marvel publication, but starting to do revisionist superheroes, which he spends a little bit of time with and what King Hell Heroica universe is really about. One thing I call attention to on these are the covers. Like, great designer. And listen, you, you talk about revisionist, history, revisionist superhero comics. This is 1985. This is before Watchmen. It's completely put together. You know, like these covers, we talked about covers in a Bart Sears column last issue or the issue before. You can see it all in this stuff. You know, he's thinking ahead. This is pop art kind of covers designed to, to stand out on the on the spinner rack or at the uh, comic book store for sure. Reworking logos on each issue. Like it's the whole, he gets to work with the whole comic book. Draws, writes, and colors these not unheard of, but, but, but also definitely not the standard. So this is one of the first Rick Veach comics that I read. And this is totally the revisionist superheroes at, at their peak. And I think I've said in the past, these books changed the way I read comics. Like you could not go back to Batman and Robin <laughs> after you've read Brat Pack, which is about superhero sidekicks. And it really looks at sort of like the underbelly of the superhero mythology like what's really going on here these are people that are going out and risking their lives and taking underage kids and minors with them very very sordid stuff kayfabers uh might recognize this image from an earlier episode i couldn't tell you which wizard we were talking about but if you go back to that one man uh you will note that i was in mid-sentence when jim throws this comic <laughs> down on the pile and i start stuttering far more than normal because i never actually seen this image before. I have a trade paperback of this, and I was gobsmacked by what <laughs> I witnessed before me. So you're, you're going to feel palpable reaction to this cover on, uh, on that whatever episode that was. Some kayfaber will know and put it in the comments. But again, look how great these covers are. Absolutely. I mean, this is, this is iconic at, mm -hmm. at this point, man, especially in later Wizards when they get into the price guide. Like, this is an arresting image that they show off regularly man because it's like we all know the domino mask is like the robin thing and you know 
This is clearly a sidekick, and just that says it all. I feel like this cover would be controversial even today. Oh, for sure. With these shorties that got the Kool-Aid running through their veins, forget about it. Well, I mean, it's American flag iconography, drug use. It's strong material. Like I said, go from Batman and Robin to Brat Pack. You don't come back uh, unscathed. It's kind of a trilogy, the King Hill Heroica kind of, right? Yeah, I think it was planned to be like maybe five books in all. Uh, so this would have been the, the follow-up King Hell Heroica story, Max Immortal. It's revisionist superheroes, and it's a play on the Superman mythology. A uh, super powerful alien being comes to Earth. It's not quite as uh, clean and happy as Superman. A little bit more violent, uh, I suppose a little bit more real. I always struggle to use the word real in regards to any of this, but it's definitely a darker look at some of these uh, superhero ideas. And just from our flip-throughs of all these different works, we're seeing like far more command of his tools like as we're progressing with his career like look at this just incredible k favors man especially you 20 year olds i saw that there's like 0.5 percent of our audience is uh <laughs> under 30 years old this ain't photoshop yeah good point good point i adore this work yeah grotesque and beautiful and this this was a gateway for me you know like this really bridged the gap from the uh spinner rack to the to the small press i have a confession to make uh i have not read very much Rick Veach Swamp Thing at all. I haven't either. That's a hole in my uh, collection, and I'm freely admitting that, man. But we do have a few more Rick Veach comics to talk about. The first mentions of 1963, one of our favorite series that, that Image Comics has ever put out, uh, is being announced sort of towards the end here. A collaboration with Alan Moore. You know, we got the Alan Moore spawn number eight, and Moore sticking with... Uh, the, the big eye, man. Of course Rick Veach is there. Rick Veach does a lot of Alan Moore collaboration through the years. We mentioned Swamp Thing. Tom Palmer mentioned Swamp Thing as well. You know, he would do fill-in issues at first. Then he did some writing and took over Swamp Thing after Alan Moore's run. But he also did the birthing sequence in Miracle Man, which we covered, I think, last episode or the episode before. Um, he does 1963. Alan Moore goes on and does a lot of Supreme work for Rob Liefeld. Rick Veach does a lot of the illustration work on that. And eventually, Alan Moore starts the America's Best Comics line, and Rick Veach does Gray Shirt. Yeah, an amazing tandem in comics, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, we're not going to get too deep into 1963 right now, because we will be indulging in a future episode and really dropping some science about this great series. Yeah, and one other piece that I brought along is Army at Love. Army at Love is... Rick Veach's, like, second go-round with DC Comics. He picked up the slack after Alan Moore left, wrote and drew uh, the Swamp Thing comic for some, some time, um, was working on a big storyline where, where Swamp Thing is, is traveling through time, basically, I right, guess. exactly. And kind of uh, somehow through the magic of comics, ends up at the, uh, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, you know, those corporate suits, man, they're, they're playing it safe. They're not going to let something like that go by, man. I think it's super cool that he tried. I don't know that you could be surprised when they say no, which they inevitably did. They solicit, uh, like, Neil Gaiman and a couple other people to try to pick up where uh, Veach left off. And he was going to just, like, pick up the story an issue or two later, something like that. They say, no, no thanks. We're not going to touch this one. He ultimately splits. Time heals all wounds, they say, Jim. And yeah, so this is probably... 15 years later or more, uh, he's back at Vertigo with Army at Love. Kind of a satire of our post-9-11 state of war. And, and the ubiquitous nature of like how technology affects. The, you know, this at symbol is there for a reason. Part of the reason I brought this and, and thought it was worth a flip through is to, to point out this is a guy who was really good in the early 1970s. And here he is 30 years later. Still brimming with ideas, still brimming with energy, still being topical. Come quite a ways. Which I would expect. You know, there, there are artists that don't seem to change at all in 30 years. Uh, we're not talking about them notice. No, <laughs> yeah. Rick Veach, we salute you, sir. Recommended reading everything that we've already mentioned. The triple threat of the King Hell Heroica. Uh, the one, do they not include the one with uh, King Hell Heroica? I guess they don't, but it's definitely the beginning of that revisionist superhero, you know, at least in, in Veach's work, but probably at large at some of the earliest mainstream 
revisionist superhero stuff I can think of. Rick starts writing and uh, penciling Swamp Thing from issue 65 to 87, and then get that heartburst graphic novel. He self-published the Abraxas stuff that appeared in Epic Illustrated 10 to 17, two, be- two issue Bedlam series that we just mentioned. Uh, he's had stuff pop up in, in uh, Taboo, and uh, just a little cherry on top. Did a triple, uh, did a trilogy of issues of uh, Eastman and Laird's Ninja Turtles. I have issue 30. I don't know if it's, uh, if it's like, okay, it's 25 to 27. Uh, I don't know that that's 100% correct because this is issue 30. It is correct. This is a different storyline. Oh, this is? Yeah. Awesome, man. But this one is like, harkens to like Big Daddy Roth era. Very cool to see this. Hot, hot rod stuff. Yeah, and, and you know, he's part of that group. There's kind of a group of these creators. Uh, Eastman's a big part of it. Beset, of course. Scott McCloud, uh, I think Dave Sim, you know, guys who are thinking about self-publishing, creator rights, doing work that's outside of that genre of superheroes that's so dominated by the corporate publishers, you know, for decades and decades. And so, of course, he hooks up with the, with Eastman and Laird and the Turtles guys because it there weren't that many alternatives to Marvel and DC either. You know, it, it's kind of a small industry back then, and I think everybody knew each other, and birds of a feather flocked together. So these guys who were creatively restless... They found each other, they shared ideas, and you see the overlap in books like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Jimmy, we could uh, talk about Rick Veach all day. Uh, The beauty of Palmer's Picks, though, is that once Rick starts publishing Roar and Rick's Rare Bit Themes, the Dream Comics, we're going to get another Palmer's Picks with Rick Veach, and we're going to be able to talk about Comic-Con.com and some of the stuff that he did later uh, than, than this period right here. 